Thank you, Pekka. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And with 20 centimeters of snow dropping on Sudbury, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I, as Pekka says, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, the Snow Lab Science Program, um, cutting edge science from a deep hole in the ground. Uh, there's a pumpkin there for those who didn't spot it. Right? It's Halloween. So um, in, with it being uh, Dark Matter Day, um, what I thought I'd do is I'd couch this in terms of one of the problems that we're addressing in deep underground labs like Snow Lab, and that's the dark matter problem, uh, that we have observations which uh, reveal that the mass of the universe, we don't fully understand what the components are. Uh, talk about the WIMP dark matter solution, uh, then discuss how we actually catch a WIMP, the sort of things we need to go through, and the experimental challenges which lead to the uh, use of deep underground facilities like like Snow Lab. And then uh, I'll finish by talking about Snow Lab, the dark matter program, hopefully get time to get into the neutrinos and some of the new science threads that we're operating and developing now. So it's dark matter day, um, talking about dark matter. I wore my special dark matter tie, unicorns, if you can't see it. Um, and so what is dark matter? What is the dark matter problem that we're trying to address? Well, the situation, um, especially for a detector that we're running in the Earth, we have to think about dark matter in our own galaxy and what is the, uh, the sort of issues that we're facing when we look at the galaxy. And there is fundamentally more to a galaxy than meets the eye. So if we, uh, this is some of the uh, fundamental observations that lead you to think that there's dark matter in our own galaxy and therefore we have a chance of observing it in the Earth. Um, so if you look at a galaxy like our own, it's a spiral galaxy. It's spiraling in this direction, and so you have arms that develop with the stars. Um, but you can look at the uh, spectral light from stars and use the Doppler shift of lines from light to actually measure the velocity of these stars as you go from the galactic center to the edge of the galaxy. And that's shown on this plot for a canonical galaxy. So this is the radius of the, um, of the observation against the velocity that you see. Now, what you would expect to see if the galaxy, if all there was to the galaxy was the visible luminous matter, you'd expect the velocity to drop off just from normal kinematics. You'd expect this line to fall away. What you actually observe is a flat rotation curve. You see that the velocity of the stars at the edge of the galaxy is way too high if all there is is the mass that you see in this photograph. So there must be something more, some more gravitational material holding those stars in their orbits. Otherwise, the galaxy would f that those stars would fly off from the galaxy. And if you interpret um, the observations, you end up with something between 60 to 80% of the mass of the galaxy needs to be in this non-luminous form. So you know, being creative physicists, we call this non-luminous matter that we can see gravitation. We call that dark matter. You can see it's there from its gravitational influence. You just can't observe it in um, visible light or other um, electromagnetic wavelengths. If you look at uh, our own galaxy, so this is obviously looking um, at extra gal galaxies outside our own. If you look at our own galaxy, we see the same sort of effect of a flat rotation curve. And our speed is about 220 um, kilometers per second. We should be about 180. So even where we are now, there is an influence of dark matter in holding, uh, holding us in our orbit, allowing us to go faster than we, are, uh, we anticipate. If you extend this to larger scales, um, there are a couple of ways to do this. And on the right is um, a photograph from the Hubble Deep Field. Every year, uh, so this is where Hubble pointed a, a dark spot in the sky and basically just left the exposure running. So every yellow image that you see in there is a galaxy. And you can see these blue arcs of light. Again, if you look spectroscopically, you find that they are the same uh, galaxy. They're images of the same galaxy. And what's happened is that there is a blue galaxy behind this galactic cluster. And the light from that galaxy has been bent by the gravitational influence of the, uh, of the clusters of, of galaxies. If you then look, uh, if you invert this problem and you look at these blue arcs and you say, okay, what does the lens need to look like? for us to get the images that we see. Uh, that's shown on this plot down at the bottom, an XY scan. The spikes are the individual galaxy uh, that you can pick up here. But you'll see there's a general distribution. There's a general background distribution. So there's material there. We know it has gravitational influence because it's bent the light more than, it's, uh, more than you'd expect. Uh, 
the, the upshot of this is that these blue arcs have been brought in further than you would anticipate. So it's actually bent the light more than you expect. And again, this turns out to be somewhere between 60 and 80% of the mass in this galactic cluster is in this unknown form. So one of the questions that uh, we often get is, well, maybe it's just gravity that is wrong, that we don't understand gravity. And the image here is, um, on the left, is showing uh, two interacting clusters, called the Bullock Cluster. And uh, what's happened here is that you've got two sets of galaxies that pass through each other. So this galaxy cluster here has moved that way, this galaxy this way. And um, using X-ray imaging, you can work out where the hot material is, the normal matter is. And then again, using this concept of gravitational lensing, you can see where most of the bulk of the material is, and that's picked out in blue, that's the dark matter. Now there's a separation. If we didn't understand gravity properly, those two images will be overlapped because the, the gravitational influence would be coexistent with where the material is. But it's been stripped. So this gives us some indication that the, uh, there is a separation between the gravitationally bound material and the hot material. And that's this, this dark matter separation. So at the, uh, at the very large scale, or at the scale of galaxy clusters, again, we see that there is evidence, strong evidence for material that interacts gravitationally, but we can't see what it is. And then if you go to the, the largest scales, and here you're using things like cosmic microwave background measurements, looking at the general um, large scale structures that you see, the overall flow. Um, we again find that there is more material than we, uh, we can explain. So at the mass of the universe, we're discussing the mass of the universe in terms of a, a ratio omega. Omega is built up from several uh, components. A matter component, uh, this is the dark energy component, and a curvature component. The matter component has uh, several components itself. So this is cold dark matter, hot dark matter, and baryonic matter, the normal material that we know and love. And uh, if you take all of the CMB observations, all of these various different observations, then you end up with a, a recipe for the universe, which is shown here. So about 73% is in terms of this omega uh, lambda, this, um, the, the dark energy component. About 27% is matter, of which only 4% is the normal material that we know. So there's about 23% of the, uh, of the matter component of the universe, uh, we don't know what it is. It's this non-baryonic cold dark matter. This, the uh, graphic that's been running on the right is a simulation where you basically take this recipe, drop it into a simulation, and cook the universe. And over time, the universe evolves, and you start seeing the structures which look very similar to those that we do in the universe as we look out. So this is giving us confidence that this sort of, um, this sort of recipe is indeed correct. So um, there's a cosmological standard model known as the concordance, and that is that we don't know what 95% of the universe is. So that's quite a strong problem. Most of it is this dark energy, and the component that we're I'm talking about is this non-baryonic cold dark matter. So I think I, I hope I've convinced you that there is strong evidence from observation, cosmology and uh, astrono astronomical observations, that when you look at a system on that scale, there is more material there than meets the eye. So clearly, <laughs> the force is dark energy. And this is the look you get from a graduate student when you make a howler. <laughs> but it's dark matter that binds the galaxy together, not dark energy. Right. Anyway. So there's stuff out there, we don't know what it is. What could it be? Um, and this is where particle physicists get interested. And the, uh, the standard model in particle physics, I'm sure you're aware of, um, where you have various particles that go to make up everything and the forces and so on. And you know, the Higgs was the last particle discovered, 2013. The standard model of particle physics, it's been extremely successful. It's basically passed every test against the model, caveat the neutrino mass that we discovered in Canada. Um, it's tested every, uh, successfully against every prediction. Um, but there are technical issues with this, theoretical issues with this, especially at high energies. And um, one of the ways that you can um, make everything fit together again is you can introduce an even higher symmetry. Uh, so the, the standard model is very symmetric. You can introduce a, a, another higher symmetry. Uh, and this is where supersymmetry would come in. And supersymmetry, um, it's 
One of, the, uh, one of the models that is trying to be tested at the LHC in Geneva, in CERN, and currently it is under stress because the, the measurements at the LHC are not giving evidence that supersymmetry is, uh, is the way that the world is built. Um, but one of the, talking to some of the theoretical people who admittedly believe in supersymmetry, um, they're saying that the, the high Higgs mass um, that we observe pushes the natural energy for supersymmetry to TV scales. So some of these particles will be heavier than we previously thought and potentially just outside the reach of the LHC. From our story, one of the um, issues is that some of these supersymmetric particles are neutral. They would only be weakly interacting and gravitationally interacting and uh, obviously would have mass. So they'll be ideal candidates for these weakly interacting massive particles that may make up the dark matter. So a lot of focus over the last, um, over the last 20, 30 years has been on supersymmetry. Um, but supersymmetry is just one of the potential solutions in a generic mo uh, set of models called WIMPs. So this is the weakly interacting massive particle. And um, one of the things that got everybody uh, really hooked on this is that the WIMPs are produced in the early universe. As the universe uh, expands, so this is, the, uh, this is the number density of the particle as the, uh, as the universe temperature cools off as it expands. Um, in the early universe, they're in thermal equilibrium, so they're being produced all the time. Production stalls when the temperature falls below the mass of the WIMP. And depending, as, as it expands, the number density drops. So eventually you get to a point where it freezes out because they can't meet each other to annihilate. And they basically, you, you end up with this expansion giving you a particular number density. And uh, that's shown here with a dotted line. And this, where this falls will depend on the cross-section um, or the, the annihilation cross-section uh, of the particle. So you end up with a production process which um, is given here Completely coincidentally, what, looking at all the, ab, uh, all the astronomical observations that I showed you previously, the required number density turns out to be 310 to the minus 26 per cubic centimeter per second, and that corresponds exactly with the, um, the, the, the scale in the production process. And this is known as the WIMP miracle. So you have two different processes, two completely different areas. You've got the particle physics in terms of the production, and you have the cosmological and astronomical observations, and they're giving you an indicator that you know, the same sort, of, um, same sort of number density that you, you need from both uh, is what you need, is what you get. So you have this WIMP miracle. So this was uh, a very compelling argument, especially in the 80s and 90s, um, in terms of where, where to look for uh, these WIMPs using supersymmetry as a guide to do that. So how do you catch one of these, um, one of these wimps. So if you think about a detector running on the, uh, on the Earth, uh, the velocity of the Earth with respect to this dark matter halo that must be around us is about 220 kilometers per second. Uh, the canonical mass of the wimp that we're anticipating is about 100 jet. So what does that translate to in the energy? Well, let's just take the maximum energy and assume it was total energy transfer. So if you take the uh, standard kinetic energy equation, you end up with 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 15 joules. Um, what else deposits that sort of level of energy? So it's a 10,000th of a mosquito landing on your arm, uh, one red blood cell traveling near to your heart, or being in Canada, a hockey puck traveling at an incredibly small velocity. Right. So these are incredibly, thanks to Ken Clark, for the, you know, this is obviously a Sudbury thing, right? You know, the mosquito. But thanks to Ken for the hockey calculation. Um, so this, this is an incredibly small amount of energy. So the challenge that you have is that you have a small energy deposition, you know, a few tens of keV. Uh, you have a low rate, which can be down at the you know, tenth of an event per ton per year for type of scale. Um, one of the technical challenges is that because it's a kinematic reaction where what you're, you're looking for is you have your detector nuclei, a wimp just hits it, the nuclei recoils, and you're looking for the energy of that recoiling nucleus. The energy spectrum of that recoiling nucleus is exponential, which is similar to many noise backgrounds. So taking these as inputs, your detection technique needs to be extremely low background. By that, I mean um, you know, radiological background. 
So you need to get rid of radiation from any radium impurities which is, are in your detector or in your, shield, in your environment around you. You want to have a uh, very low threshold to pick up this small energy deposition. Uh, preferably, you would like it to be able to tell the difference between a WIMP and everything else that might hit the detector. And uh, to give you a, um, a proxy, neutrons, we think, will behave exactly like WIMP. So a neutron coming in, it's uncharged, it will come through, it will hit the nucleus, cause the nucleus to recoil, and it will look exactly like a WIMP. So neutrons are kryptonite to dark matter experiments. You've really got to get rid of them all. And ultimately, because of this very low rate, you're going to have to build extremely large detectors. So um, this takes us to um, underground facilities. Now, the first underground lab that I can find is actually, was actually one that was uh, operated by C.T.R. Wilson in the early 20th century, which is the Needpath Railway Tunnel. And this is the, uh, the rail, obviously it's not a railroad tunnel now. Um, and he was interested at this time in the origin of cosmic rays. So this was when it wasn't known that cosmic rays came down. And uh, he thought, OK, I'll go, I'll go into a railway tunnel. I'll take my electroscopes into a railway tunnel. If the cosmic rays are coming down, you know, this overburden above me will soak up some of the cosmic radiation, and I'll be able to tell whether it's coming you know, from down or up. Uh, unfortunately, his detectors weren't sensitive enough, so this was a completely inconclusive test. Uh, and it took you know, Hess, basically, to go nine kilometers in a hot air balloon without oxygen to prove that they were coming from uh, outer space. But this was, as far as I can tell, the first underground test. And the fundamentals are still correct that you want to put a, an overburden between your experiment and the cosmic rays coming down to reduce the, uh, the muon flux specifically. That gets rid of the muon flux itself, but it also gets rid of any secondary particles that may be created. And neutrons come into this as well. So when a muon hits the rock around you, it can spallate neutrons out of the rock. Those neutrons could then get into your detector and mimic dark matter. So you want to, uh, you want to reduce the muon flux as much as possible. Even then, you uh, are running detectors in a uh, dirty railway tunnel. So you want to put a lot of shielding inside the, the space that you have. Make sure you're soaking up all the radiation from the uh, ambient environment. And then you have a, an accessible space for detectors in the middle. So uh, looking at the effect of overburden, um, there are a variety of labs around the world. And this is shown on this plot here. So this is the muon flux square centimeters per second against the depth. And this is the, uh, the claim depth of the lab. And you can see that uh, Snow Lab is just over two kilometers deep, so four CN towers deep. Uh, there is another lab that's just opened in China, uh, which is somewhat deeper. The actual muon flux is about a factor of two different. Uh, but you can see throughout the world, there's uh, you know, many labs operating in this space. So um, the one of the objectives is, obviously, to go deep, reduce the muon flux. Um, the muon flux in the various labs depends not only on the overburden. There are seasonal effects. So the, um, the depth of the atmosphere changes from summer to winter, just from the, um, just from the temperature variation. And that's shown here as a function uh, of muon flux from one of the shallower labs, the Sudan lab. You see this annual modulation process. It also depends on the overburden, um, the profile. So if you're in a uh, road tunnel or a railway tunnel through a mountain range, you have to worry about the profile of the mountain. So as you, you take an azimuthal scan, then you, you actually get a different overburden as you're looking through the mountain range or looking um, through the side of the mountain. And that's shown here for Grand Sasso. Um, so the zenith angle distribution is pretty uniform. But the azimuthal angle is actually mapping out the profile of the, of the mountain range. And that's the reason that you see on this plot, there's um, a variety of, um, gi given a measurement of a muon flux, there's a variety of claim depth. So for instance, SURF is a facility in uh, the US which is also in a deep mine. So that has a flat overburden. Um, the ones that are on the dotted line are all mines. So, you know, being in the Canadian Shield has benefit here because it makes it, uh, you know, makes our overburden very uniform. The other issue that we have to worry about are the radiogenic backgrounds in facilities. Um, and shown here is the, uh, the gamma distribution as a function of energy and the neutron spectrum as a function of energy for various labs. 
Uh, the black and the blue lines are, uh, so the black line is the surface, the blue line is the Grand Sasso lab where you've soaked up the, um, the cosmic ray gamma flux above 3 MeV, and the red line is the Baldy facility which is in salt, which is low in uranium and thorium which means it's low in gamma activity. And that's important for certain types of science that we're doing. So for things like um, nuclear astrophysics, where you need a very low, uh, low gamma background environment, starting off with something like this is very, uh, very positive. More important, perhaps, is because it's low in uranium and thorium, it's also low in radon. So Bulby has a, a radon fl um, flux, which is about an order of magnitude lower than any other facility. That's my pitch for Bull because I used to work there. But you don't want to go there now. You want to come to Snow Labs. <laughs> so the neutron flux, the neutron spectrum also depends on the local environment. And shown here, blue is the Grand Sasso lab. Uh, red is the Modan lab in France. And the spectrum depends very much on the local geology. So the issue here, for instance, is that depending on the um, amount of moderator you might have, say water, in the mountain range, something like this. The amount of water that you have can soak up neutrons. And this has, uh, this has direct impact for the dark matter studies, because as I mentioned, you want to make sure you remove as many neutrons as possible. So there are a variety of labs around the world, as I said, and the best one is Snow Lab. So the, uh, the Snow Lab facility, it's, it's in a, an operating nickel mine, uh, operated by Valet Limited, and that really helps. I mean, they're their support, we estimate, is worth between 12 and $15 million a year just in access to the 6,800-foot level. Uh, it's developed from the original snow detector that Pekka mentioned, and construction comes from uh, Canadian Foundation for Innovation and some of the other um, research centers. And we're operated uh, as a joint venture between these five Canadian universities. So the... Um, snow Lab grew out of the snow project, so we're continuing the legacy um, that Art got the 2015 Nobel Prize for, for uh, demonstrating uh, flavor oscillation in neutrinos and mass. And I've just stolen one of his slides showing that here. So um, this was the measurement from snow looking at all neutrino types against the solar model uh, compared to all the previous experiments where they'd basically just been looking for the electron neutrino, which of course is produced in the sun. That's, that's what's produced from nuclear fusion. So the projects were originally looking for that type of neutrino, uh, but when you add them all together, you can see that the prediction is correct. It's just that two-thirds of them have changed from electron neutrinos into something else. So that, uh, uh, that was uh, stellar work in terms of um, obviously solving the uh, solar neutrino problem, but it also demonstrated that we could do these complex experiments in a place like, sub in, in a place like the Triton mine. So I just wanted to uh, let Art have a word about uh, this. It's an illustrious list, including Lester B. Pearson, Alice Munro, and now a guy from Cape Breton. <laughs> Physicist Arthur McDonald is Canada's latest winner of a Nobel Prize. Here to explain why he's the best in the world at what he does is Art McDonald. Hi, I'm Art McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus at Queen's University, originally from Cape Breton, and I attended Dalhousie University. And I'm a co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, people from uh, 22 Minutes have asked me to come in and explain what uh, I and our team did to win this prize. We demonstrated that the flavor of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, changed into one of the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, as they traveled from the core of the sun to Okay, I'm, I'm being told I have to make it simpler. Um, <laughs> neutrinos are very basic subatomic particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further. And uh, okay, they're asking me to uh, dumb it down a little bit. Um, uh, a subatomic particle is uh, smaller than an atom. Atom is a unit of matter. Really? You don't know what matter is? <laughs> it's seven. Okay. Uh, neutrinos are like Timbits. Uh, sometimes they're like chocolate. Uh, sometimes they're like um, uh, cherry-filled. And sometimes they're like the uh, old-fashioned glaze. 
I must be the first person that ever won a Nobel Prize in Timbit. <laughs> Art loves Timbit, by the way, yeah, if you ever see it. All right, so on the back of the success of snow, um, we've developed the snow lab facility. And to give you an idea about the, the sort of scale we're working at now, now we have a, a community. If you look at all the projects we're supporting and add up the collaboration list, we're a community of, about eight, of over 850 users, 23 countries. Uh, we added Poland last month. Uh, the Governor General was there witnessing the signature. Um, so that's the canonical map showing the, the coverage that we have. Uh, you know, we need to uh, work on penetration into Africa and Australia, of course. Um, if you look at the user base, um, so this is the number of users on the collaboration. You can see it's dominated very much by the North American uh, side of things. So 40% US, 26% Canadian, and you know, whatever the rest is from the rest of the world. Um, Snow Lab is, uh, as Pekka mentioned, is up in Sudbury. So this is the uh, Google Earth image. Um, this is always snowy, obviously. This is not always snowy. Uh, that's the facility. So this is the mining uh, complex here. The facility is a mile from the mine shafts. Uh, that's our surface building, the Snow Lab surface building. Uh, in that surface building, we'd have what you, it, you would expect. So you know, there's labs for people to do development work before they take the detectors underground. Uh, we have all the office stuff. We've got the ancillary support. We also have uh, chemistry labs and uh, a 4,000 square meter clean room so that people can do work before they uh, ship things underground. For anyone who visited the original snow experiment, this, uh, this shows you the layout where uh, the snow detector was here with the clean room boundary at this point. We've pushed the clean room boundary to out here. This has all been excavated specifically for snow lab. So we now have three major cavities, the snow cavern, the pupil, and the cryopit, and then subsidiary uh, drifts for the, for the project. Um, just a few slides around Snow Lab. So as you go in, uh, you, go, you remind yourself that you're in a, a working mine. So you're, you're now just over two kilometers underground, 6,800 feet. And what you see on the walls here are the, sec are the support systems to keep the cavity open and the drifts open, which is very important. Uh, so you see there are rock bolts that are put into the rock face. There is a meshing which uh, traps any loose material coming off the side. Uh, this is the entryway to Snow Lab. Um, we have two sets of doors. We have a, a series of doors for uh, material going in. Uh, you'll see the railway line, so we tram everything from the, um, uh, from the, rock sha from the shaft to the, uh, to the lab, and then there's a personnel door on the side. Um, inside the lab, we're now looking out through the, uh, through the material access, so the, the mine is out here. We have two clean cleaning off bay areas, one painted red to remind you in, you're in a semi-dirty area, and uh, everything gets cleaned in there, brought into the second bay, cleaned again, and then brought in. So we run Snow Lab as a class 2000 clean room throughout the entire place, which is pretty insane in a mine, but it's what's required for the physics. It's what's required for the experiments. Part of the way we do that is um, we have concrete blown onto the walls here, so shock creep. And um, in the new areas, it's troweled smooth, so we have a very smooth uh, layer, which makes it easy to clean. Uh, the sort of infrastructure that we can then construct, this shows you the cube hall um, before, uh, as, as some, of the, uh, some of the infrastructure was being built for the deep experiment here and the mini clean experiment. And um, the point of this is this is the longest piece that we've ever brought underground because you have to bring everything down the, down the shaft, down in the cage. And when you get to the level, you've got to bring it out under the, uh, bring it out from underneath the cage and drag it around. So there's actually a maximum length of material that you can take underground and a maximum size. So what the snow, part of what the Snow Lab team is there to do is to make that transparent to the users so that we will work with the project, design the project in a way which are modular so that we can bring it underground and then we take care of all of that. And you can go from that sort of um, system into this is where we have both mini clean and deep operational. Uh, so I'll talk about deep in a second and the, uh, the mini clean dark matter detector there. Um, this is uh, part of the ladder lab, so this is one of the small, smallish tunnels. This is actually where Super CDMS is going to go. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, and again, um, some of the change once you start introducing material. So the program is growing. Um, 
We have a very broad science program. Um, you'll see that, met that, so these are the projects that, we, uh, that we've been supporting. Many of them are in, in the dark matter category. Uh, we have several neutrino experiments. Uh, but there are also some new threads that I, I will discuss as well. And one of the capabilities that we're using a lot is the low background assay. So this is where you're looking at between 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 18 grams per gram of uranium or thorium in uh, materials. And that opens up different science threads. Um, one that we've just started thinking about is the quantum computing. Uh, where if you're using a superconducting qubit, it turns out that radio, the background radiation is actually what limits uh, the coherence time that you can maintain. So we may end up needing to run quantum computers underground, which will be a great way to support Snow Lab. Um, this is how it all fits into that map that I showed before. The color coding here is green is operational, red is complete, and yellow are projects that are in construction or planned. Um, you will note, and I'll mention this later, the, the cryo pit, which was, um, until quite recently, an open cavity we now have now have dedicated to the double beta decay program. So I'm running out of time. Yes. Um, this is our program at Dark Matter. I'm not going to read through this. It's just to give you the sense that there's an awful lot going on. And what I, um, I'm going to pick up on is one of the a couple of the experiments. Um, Deep 3600 is a liquid argon dark matter detector uh, which has very good discrimination potential between gammas hitting it and neutrons or wimps hitting it. And the design here is that we have um, 3.6 tons of argon in an acrylic vessel. The acrylic is, or the, the vessel is then viewed by 255 photomultiplier tubes which are on standoffs to soak up some of the radiation. Uh, you then have uh, all of this contained in a steel pressure system which is then put into a water tank to shield the detector from the ambient background radiation. So this is the uh, few shots of the construction. Um, this is once the detector has been built, what you're looking at are the uh, photomultiplier back ends, and then the copper is acting as a thermal buffer. So the outside of the detector, or the outside in the water tanks at uh, just above, well, just below room temperature, and obviously um, we're going into a cryogenic fluid, so we want to make sure that we have thermal shielding and maintaining the uh, photomultipliers at the correct operating temperature. That's what the copper is for to conduct the heat in. Um, that is then contained in a steel vessel. Uh, the photomultipliers here are looking into the water tank and that's as a muon veto. And then ultimately you build the water tank around it and operate. Um, one of the aspects that I mentioned is we need to be able to tell the difference between neutrons and gammas and shown here uh, from one of the recent papers is the discrimination potential. So this is photoelectron, measured in photoelectrons, uh, but this is at about 30 kV, oh, yeah, the kV is up here. So this is the electron efficient, uh, electron equivalent uh, energy, uh, 10, 20, 30 kV recoil. So we're getting into that range where we need to. And what's shown is a response from a, a neutron source where these are the gammas uh, in some parameter called F prompt, which is basically just the, um, the speed of the scintillation light coming out from the liquid argon. And there is a clear separation between the gamma band here and these are neutrons from the neutron source. The box is where we, are, um, where we define we're going to look for dark matter. Um, obviously, we take the neutron source away. Doing a scan through um, one of these photoelectron slices here, you can see the, um, the distribution uh, picked out in the black points. Again, this is against F prompt. And this is the gamma band, and that's the neutron band. And these are the, uh, the americium beryllium gammas, and that's the nuclear recoils from the argon-39 beta I'll mention in a minute. So uh, the point of showing this is that we have very good discrimination between the neutrons and the gammas, which allows us to get rid of most of the signal. Now argon has um, a particular issue if you take it from the atmosphere, because there is um, activation which gives you argon-39 and it's a beta emitter. And this actually works uh, as a calibration source. It's a pain when you're looking for dark matter because of the background, but it's a great calibration source. And uh, that's shown here against, again, the number of photoelectrons against the counts per bin. The black is the, uh, the data, and the, the, re the red is the fit, which comes from uh, the background model, that I'll just show in a minute. Um, and there is some energy saturation on the DAQ, which is just shown in the inset, but um, 
you know, fundamentally, we have an extremely well calibrated detector because we can see this gamma flux. We can see these betas throughout the volume. Um, so the overall uh, spectrum that you get when you run this detector in this very well shielded environment is shown here. And uh, this is the gamma spectrum as a function of energy, now measured in KeV. Uh, the two plots, the top plot is the actual distribution, the spectra, the bottom plot is the residual, so you can see that the fit is a, a very good fit. Um, and the various components that go into the model are these various lines. So you, you see that these are from components that you're building your detector from. So these are the photomultipliers, the steel, the liquid argon, and so on. The range of interest is down here, and the greatest... Uh, distribution is actually from this argon 39 beta, which is this um, plummeting distribution here. So that turns out to be one of the limiting factors for these sort of detectors uh, for the argon system. And recent results from DEEP um, have just been published. So this is a, a FISREV paper that's just come out. Um, shown on the left of the cut efficiencies, the bottom line is that um, for a variety of reasons, we needed to fiducialize very hard and the cut efficiency comes down to just around 24%. Uh, with that cut efficiency, when you look in the region of interest, uh, there are no events within the predefined boundary. There are a couple right on the boundary, but there are no events within the predefined boundary, uh, which means we haven't seen dark matter. Um, but we can set a sensitivity limit on um, the dark matter interaction. So this shows you the dark matter nucleon scattering uh, this is spin-independent scattering cross-section against the mass of the WIMP. And you can set a limit. What's shown in the, um, the, the gray here is the, uh, the deep 3600 limit, uh, which is the leading liquid argon uh, result. And these bands down here are from the competing liquid xenon detectors. So we're about an order of magnitude behind the world-leading uh, liquid xenon systems. But this was from one year's worth of data and we have another couple of years in the bag that are being analyzed now. Um, a point that I like to make about dark matter searches, because it is dark matter um, day to day, is that over the last 20 years, we've, we've actually improved the uh, sensitivity by a factor of 50. Um, so that's, that's beating Moore's law. So for a, you know, for a, for a system that hasn't seen, uh, you know, th this is my, this is my, social pitch, right? Because you'll, you'll often read articles about, you know, is dark matter done? Are we done with dark matter because we've not seen anything? Um, you know, we haven't seen anything that is true, but it's not for want of trying. You know, we have really improved the detector sensitivities and obviously have uh, ideas about how to improve that further. Um, just a quick word on the uh, argon-39 thing. Um, all of the liquid argon groups globally have now come together in a single collaboration for future detectors. And the next step is a detector called Darkside 20K. So it's 20 tons of liquid argon in Grand Sasso. And Snow Lab will then uh, come back into the game with uh, a detector called Argo, which will be 300 tons. Um, so the Canadian input to these projects at the moment is the deep data itself that I've just been showing you. The, um, Production of depleted of argon 39 depleted argon, um, silicon photomultiplier development, and there is an R&D platform in development. So the uh, the issue about the argon 39 is that this is because if we take it from the atmosphere, natural argon, uh, you end up with something like 10 to the minus 16 atoms of argon 39 uh, per argon atom, which is creates about a becquerel per kilogram, and that's way too high to see these dark matter signatures. However, if you take argon from underground, it's been shielded from cosmic radiation. It hasn't been activated. And from certain, uh, certain sources, you actually get argon, which is very low in argon-39. And this is uh, what we're doing in a, uh, a well in Colorado, which is actually a carbon dioxide well. Um, there is a, so it's run by uh, Kinder Morgan. But there is a, a, a stream that we are now taking out from here for the argon, which is about a factor of 1,400 lower in, uh, in argon-39 than the atmospheric argon that we've been uh, using so far. And uh, as a byproduct, this now produces 3% of the U.S.'s helium, because uh, there is also helium in that stream. Okay, so that's the uh, liquid argon systems. Um, because Toronto is engaged in super-CDMS, it would be remiss not to talk about this. 
So the Super CDMS detector at Snow Lab is coming. Um, it's part of the US uh, G2 program. Uh, so it has substantial input from the US and Canada. And it uses germanium silica, silicon crystals in millikelvin cryostats. Um, so what you're doing here is you're, uh, rather than looking at scintillation light from liquid argon, you're looking at uh, phonon production in a cryogenic crystal. And these are being run in a mode where you're getting down to very low energies. Um, and that's just shown here where you have an interaction, you have a, what, what they call a high voltage between the uh, two electrodes here, and you get loop phonons which amplify this. Um, so you can actually get down to seeing very low uh, phonon energy. Um, the cryostat will uh, eventually, we hope, uh, hold 400 kilograms, but initially 25 kilograms is gonna be deployed. And the, uh, this shows you the cryostat that was uh, just operational in Fermilab last week, and one of the, uh, one of the detector sensors. So the, uh, in terms of snow lab infrastructure, we're building a lot of the ancillary infrastructure now. So this is low radon uh, or radon scrubbing for, for a clean room. Uh, walls are going in. You can see all the cable trays going in. Um, and soon we will take delivery of this uh, lead shield, which this shows you the lead shield uh, fit test, which is completed at the manufacturer. And as I mentioned, the cryogenic fridge operation was achieved this week. Um, it all fits into the, one of the uh, endpoints of the ladder labs. So this will be the shield environment. This is the, uh, the DAQ readout, the electronics readout, the clean room into which the crystals will be inserted in the cryostat, and then everything else that is required to support that. Um, something I want to pick out is that there is also a test facility, the cryogenic underground test experiment, or test facility, uh, CUTE. And uh, this is a Canadian contribution led primarily by Gilles Gibier at Queen's. Um, and that is now operational. Uh, so it's a small water shielded tank with a fridge, uh, which is in a dry well, shown here. Uh, that's the dry well. You put a lid on. Uh, that's a crystal uh, that went in, one of the Pathfinder crystals. So there's only one crystal, not a stack. But the first pulses were actually uh, seen uh, just before the August shutdown. So the first pulses from a Super CDMS crystal have now been observed in, uh, in Snow Lab. So that's the Dark Matter program. So just to finish off quickly, the neutrino stuff. Um, we're engaged in double beta decay projects. So um, what you're looking for there is a process where you get two beta um, events happening, but no neutrinos. And that can happen if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, which means it's uh, Majorana and it has mass. And what you then end up with is just two electrons coming out from this process. And you look at the sum energy of those electrons. What you see from the beta spectrum is the two neutrino spectrum. And then at the end, you get the full energy of the electrons and you get a spike. Um, the issue is that these are very short, uh, very long um, timelines. I mean, this is obviously much greater than the age of the universe, which means you need a large detector to pick up um, those, sort of, um, those sort of signatures. And we have a couple of projects currently running at Snow Lab, um, looking at the um, double beta decay, snow plush using tellurium. Um, sorry, and the halo is actually looking for supernova. So snow plus reuses the original snow detector. Um, all the engineering is complete. The water data uh, taking started in May 26, 2017, and we've published initial results this summer. Uh, the sun still shines, so we see neutrinos um, from, from the sun. The objective is to put 780 tons of LAB in, and uh, the LAB plant is operational. We were filling today, but uh, so far we've got about 25 kilos out of the 780 into the detector. And the uh, tellurium, the double beta decay isotope, uh, that plant is in construction, and we expect data to start at the end of next year. Um, so the half-life reach is gonna be of order 10 to the 26 years. Um, so it shows you some of the, uh, the design of the snow plus detector reusing the snow infrastructure with a rope net holding the detector down because the LAB is now buoyant. Uh, some of the infrastructure for the LAB plant and the sort of signal that you might expect to see. Um, and just the state where we are at the moment. So the first neutrino event, this is an illustration of the first neutrino event observed in water. Uh, as I mentioned, we're now filling with LAB, so this is a recent image where you can see the LAB floating on top of water in the detector. And so we anticipate the LAB fill to be done sometime in January. Um, following on from Snow Plus, 
Uh, there is a, another set of double beta decay experiments that we're now engaged in, and this is the Tun scale program, where uh, the DO in nuclear physics recently, end of last year, gave CD0, which means mission need. So we know this program is going to happen. We don't know which experiment yet, but we know that this uh, Tun scale program is going to happen. And the cryo pit uh, is now targeted towards this, this program. So you can see here um, engineering drawings or mock-ups from the Legend 1000 experiment that uses germanium and the Nexo experiment that uses xenon, both of them in the cryo pit. So both of them are anticipating using that, uh, using, using a cryo pit. Obviously, they don't both fit, and that's the point of this down select that will happen uh, at CD1. Um, if we needed to support both of those projects. We have also been looking at expanding Snow Lab, um, where this shows you the current lab, and an expansion like this. Uh, and it's a complex process because you don't want to interfere with the operation of experiments in Snow Lab. Uh, it's also complex because we have to dovetail in with the mining operation itself, which limits what we can do uh, in terms of rock removal. And the cost estimate, this is now being refined, but it's of order $100, $120 million to expand the lab in this way. So that would require a substantial investment. But given that the double beta decay projects are about $400 million, uh, this is not outrageous to ask for this sort of uh, support, assuming the, um, the community covers it. So in the last minus two minutes, um, I want to touch on some of the new directions that we've been going on. And... Um, Maybe talk about some of the ge uh, genomic projects. So once you have a facility like Snow Lab, it's amazing uh, how many people connect their own research to a deep underground facility. And one of the uh, projects we have running is looking at low doses of radiation and cellular damage. And um, the issue is, if, if we look at this plot here, this is dose against, the, say, the risk of mutation in a cell. The points are where you actually have data measurement because most of the measurements are done by irradiating cells and seeing what happens to them. So these are above background measurements. Um, and the current model that people use is this LNT, linear no threshold, which basically means you just draw through the origin. And the inference is that any radiation is bad for a cell. Any radiation causes damage. There are, however, beginning to be um, some inference that a small amount of radiation is actually good for a cell because it stimulates uh, a little bit of mutation and it acts as a protective mechanism. And so uh, one of the teams that we're working with um, originally were using whitefish embryo to assess this and are now using um, a human cell strain which is um, prone to uh, cancer. That's what tumorigenic means. Um, and they take them underground, and we have built a very um, a shielded environment, a shielded um, incubator for them, where basically they will reintroduce each species of radiation underground. Obviously, we're shielded from cosmic rays, so those, there's a, uh, an equivalent system on the surface. Reintroduce each species of radiation, and then identify what the impact is on the, uh, on the cells. So, as I say, the original um, tests were done with whitefish embryos. This is one of the team um, collecting those embryos. But we're now using um, human cells so that they're more controllable. And uh, as I say, the early, the early data are beginning to support the model that, uh, you know, just like a pearl in, a, in an oyster, a small amount of radiation, that small irritant is actually good for the cell. Another genetics project that we have running is uh, flies in a mine, flame. So this is Thomas Merritt. If anybody's on Twitter, he's very prolific on Twitter. Um, and he came for a tour underground, and he realized he was exhausted. And uh, he, he, he uses fruit flies as, a tra as basically a proxy for humans. So, OK, I'll do my research. I'll take a whole bunch of fruit flies underground to Snow Lab and see what happens to the fruit fly. Fruit flies are very similar in many respects to, to humans in terms of the metabolites. So he found that, uh, you know, just a quick test, he found that 10% of the metabolites change. He doesn't know what that means, but it means that there is a difference from flies that stayed on the surface and those that went underground. So he's now doing much more controlled uh, tests where he's got a, um, a group of flies that he exercises underground because he realized this was one of the problems is that when he took the flies down originally, they just hung about and did nothing. He's now built a fly gometer, he calls it. <laughs> which rotates, rotates the uh, test tubes and the flies, you know, they do actually walk. 
So th these flies are being exercised. He has underground controls that aren't exercised, and then the surface ones as well. And what he found, uh, so this is some biology going on here. What he found, though, is that it separates into various distributions. So there is an effect in terms of going underground. Now, if anybody has been underground, you know that. It's harder to make decisions when you're underground. You feel a bit more tired. And you know, part of the interest here is from the mining community is that if there is a way, you know, Gatorade for miners, I'm trademarking that. If there is a way to help people, uh, you know, when they go underground to perform better, then this sort of research may feed into that. Um, and then the final research thread is the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Verification, the CTBT. They drop the N, <laughs> so CTBT verification. And this is using um, ultra-low radiological background assays to search for byproducts of nuclear explosions uh, or to see if you're breeding nuclear weaponry fuel. Um, so there are many tools available, seismic infra infrasound, hydroacoustic, but radionuclide is one that um, is uh, used an awful lot. And so we are now engaging in a benchmarking exercise where what's shown on this plot is just the background spectrum from several germanium detectors. This is the best that Health Canada has uh, on the surface. Uh, this is a new design using two back-to-back -back detectors and then the Snow Lab detector. And if we pick up just one here, say for cobalt-60, you can see that the Snow Lab detector is better than an order of magnitude more sensitive than the, uh, than the best surface one. And this means that you will uh, then be able to use less material to identify that. So you know, we're now getting into several new threads of research outside dark matter and neutrinos. So I will just leave this up, because I can see Peggy's getting nervous. <laughs> And that is, uh, so our story concludes. You know, we have a uh, deep underground lab supporting a wide range of research. Uh, you need very uh, low radiogenic background environments, such as uh, underground facilities. And we are now working on developing a broad and vibrant research group. Thank you. <laughs>